Right, welcome to IJDM. I would like you to join me for an adventure. Something a little different here on the channel. This actually began back in December, so you're joining me on this adventure a little later, but you didn't miss anything. The, the bottom line is what I was trying to get from one side of the country to my side of the country is here. What is here? Well, I'm not gonna tell you right now. First, what we're gonna do is rewind a little bit and do a quick little history lesson before we start this adventure together. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. We're gonna start this history lesson a little later on in radio, after the Marconi era and all the craziness that went on with the red and blue networks. And basically what we have on the screen is shots of early radio stations when they were pretty much a mechanical age, very much manually controlled. As we move through the eras, things became more and more advanced and equipment got more user friendly and obviously looked better. And we move into the mechanical age, which was usually something you would set up with different numbers and different sources and it ran through a sequence. But there was a need and a want for some type of computer automation. And one of those particular automation systems we're gonna talk about on this video and this series of videos is the Arrakis Digilink systems. I figured these were developed through the 80s and into the early 90s. They really, after being announced at NAB, really became part of many radio stations. There were other automation systems, but this particular one is one I'm fond of because having worked in that era of radio in the 90s, it was a cool, interesting thing to see these systems in action and seeing these screens and just, it was just something amazing to behold back in the day. But this is really the beginning of when audio really could go into a computer and be useful for radio stations and even automate them to different schedules and different sequences. I really miss these old Arrakis Digilink systems and I haven't seen one in years. And in order for them to work, you actually have to have one of the systems. I happen to find a few of these and now that they're here let's begin the second part of our story or should i say it's more like the fifth part of the story and take a look at what this system actually is well it's time let's take a look and see what exactly we have i'm going to kind of jump around a little bit on this video because you don't want to watch me trying to unwrap this whole thing and trying to unpack it so We'll kind of jump and do a few time lapses to just kind of, wait, am I cut off? And do a few time lapses so that you can see exactly what's in here and uh, what I got. Because I don't even know at this point. I was expecting just a few of these, but there is a whole palette of them. Right, I have them off the pallet now. Trying to get an idea of what I have and a count up of everything. I mean, a ton of Digilink 3s, a few Trackstar 3 units, were the, which was the editing workstation. Um, we have a Digilink 4 over here, surprisingly, a Gemini controller, which I think goes with this. And the other thing I'm worried about too with these Digilinks is apparently they use some kind of proprietary cable connection. So hopefully that's somewhere in the mix here, if not, I have to try to find one. Sit rep. Um, what I've done so far, and you didn't miss anything, trust me. I basically sorted through all the different units in my garage and tried to come up with what looks like the best candidate to try to work on first. Interesting enough that I did discover with these units is they have two different motherboards. This one, of course, has like a yellowish gold tinge to the background, where the other ones, it's green. And I also noticed that this one also has, I believe these were called PCI slots, where the other ones only have the ISAs, and the ISAs are obviously over here. Um, I'll explain everything inside this machine in better detail in a second, but uh, it was just something that's worthy to point out on these uh, machines that there was two, there's obviously different versions of them. Okay, let's go through and see what we got here. Obviously this deal here, and I'm not sure how much the camera's going in and out of focus. I'm hopefully, I've tried adjusting this thing but it's finicky 
Uh, just bear with me. Okay, what we got here is our power supply. Yeah, that's our standard power supply computer deal, but it's got a few extra plugs on it. And it's got like a secondary transformer unit here. I'm not really sure what that's for. Um, somebody more technical could probably, as I bump the tripod, like I usually do, um, could probably better explain what that's being used for. Um, it's probably something to do with power, obviously. Uh, this is your basic, um, I think they call these PCR. Well, this is your IDE uh, hard drive. This is basically what drives the unit software and fires up everything. It's basically the OS, which is DOS, and then the actual program and all you know the things that make the cards work and so forth. Up here, you got two SCSI drives that are in here now. Um, these are basically the two drives that were in this unit. Got your floppy disk here. Uh, there's also a reset button and an audio in and out on the front, which curiously enough, I've only been able to get the output to work and it looks like it's stereo looking at the cables. However, I'm only getting a mono output on that. So if anybody knows like a little more about these systems and worked with them a little more, um, the big thing is I'm trying, still trying to relearn everything. I actually installed these things at a radio station once and it's, this is like relearning everything all over again. I'm certain things I'm picking up on other things. It's just like, ah, ah. Um, your processor, if you can see it, is right here. Interestingly enough, there is no cooler on that processor. Um, I think I'm going to have to rig up a fan or something, which I do have standing by off camera once I power this unit on. I do not want that thing to overheat. And I know with some of these earlier 286, 386 boards, the processors didn't have any type of cooling fans. So... It may not be needed, but I'd rather have the processor running at 100 degrees versus 150, 160 degrees is what I'm saying here. Uh, you got your memory slots right here. I believe this is probably about 32, if I'm guessing 8888, 8, 8, 8 times 4, 32. And then all your IDE cables that connect everything up. I'll get to the side, be patient. Uh, right here is something I'll explain in a minute why that is there. Um, I went ahead without you on that, but I am going to explain what it is. And it's nothing that anybody that's worked with uh, retro DOS computers or earlier Windows machines knows exactly what I'm pointing at right there. Uh, right here, what appears to be part of a video card uh, or display driver, this is some kind of network tote token network ring token ring network thing it's got like a bnc style plug on it and you can interconnect these machines i'm not in i'm not going to intend to anytime soon unless somebody knows what system i would need to do that or if it's just some kind of distribution thing i need but chances are those are incredibly cost prohibitive on your first board right here i'm guessing these this board and the one right behind it that these things are literally crammed in together on these isa slots are the two uh, scuzzy cards that obviously control the scuzzy drives and that's just my wild guess because they're interconnected so how that works that would be for somebody a little more technical because i could explain it but i'd probably be talking gibberish and then your magic all happens with this card, which is basically where the audio comes from on this machine. Uh, you get some other various things like the reset button and these bays slide out on the front for easy change out. Basically all your, your music or audio is going to be stored here. Well, I should say commercial spots because music was kind of an afterthought on these things. But you'll see it you'll see, uh, soon enough. But it's kind of neat that you can just slide these drives in and out. Now let's just go ahead and jump to the backside of the unit and take a look at the interesting backside. I think you can kind of see enough of the front. It's pretty much plain other than, you know, what's there. And you'll see more of it in different, uh, different portions of these videos. Right, the backside again, this is the power supply. Uh, on the bottom, you have a couple connectors, which I'm guessing it's just more expansion type stuff. The keyboard, oddly enough, it, it's an AT style connection, which I got an adapter for a PS2. I, I thought I had an AT keyboard, but I guess I didn't. I must have got rid of them years ago. Uh, serial mouse, which interest, interestingly enough, only my Logitech mouse, which is the only serial mouse I have, is the only one that works with the unit. I tried another adapter to connect this because the keyboard I'm using is a Scorpius with a trackball, but uh, no go on the trackball so far. Maybe a special driver that I need for that keyboard for DOS. Uh, you got your monitor connection here, something for a printer, machine logic out, and then an external SCSI port. 
this is kind of an interesting little gimmick here because this is where basically all your channels come in and out from if you were in a radio station from the audio console your audio mixer uh, in simple terms for people that never worked in radio but uh, basically these would be interconnecting uh, through through your uh, mixing board uh, for different things and before anybody says it yes I had to rig this little gimmick up because I don't have any of these connectors and the best I could find digging around in my storage area was the speaker pens which actually kind of work they sometimes pop out but until I can find a better solution and maybe order some of these plugs or try to find something that would slide in there nice and neat that is the way it's going to be Oh, and one more thing. Of course, there's your network uh, BNC type uh, connector there. They may have a separate name for those when they were used for computer networks. I call them BNC because that's, that's the type of plug it is. Right then, after checking over this unit and just seeing what's going on in the condition, it's very clean. I did very little cleaning on it. There's very little dust in it. This unit was actually stored in a, in a great place, so it was a great candidate for a first fire up. Uh, the only thing that's been really changed on this thing um, is I cloned the hard drive and replaced it with an SD card, simply because if the drive fails, that's it, this whole thing. And I only have a certain amount of clone drives, and some of them will only work with certain machines. So. I wanted to make sure I had a couple clones and I want to make sure the clone works. So we're going to fire it up with this clone drive. And wow, I, <laughs> the last time I worked in radio, honestly, was back in probably the year 2000. And that was the last time I've ever seen one of these units actually be actually fired up and running. I actually uh, was using it to run my radio show. So, and some of these are actually still in service, believe it or not, but I'm stalling. I know, I know. Well, we want to see this thing up and running. So I'm grabbing the plug as we speak. And here we go. Well, this is going to be incredible. We ready for this? Okay, well, we have a BIOS. Yes. Uh oh, uh oh, what, what's going on here? Okay, there's something bad in the config sys or um, auto exec bad. I'm guessing because of the network stuff. I can always disable that later. Oh, I hear. Look at that. Look at that, everyone. That is a Digilink unit, probably made in the year 1998, maybe 96, somewhere in the late 90s between, let's say, 95 and 98, coming back to life. And it's doing a scanning directory list. And oh, wow, there it is. Yes, okay, yeah. This is totally cool. Wow. This is amazing. Okay, so, uh, wow, give me a moment. I just, I need to look at this for a moment because I haven't seen this screen in person in so long. And I mean, granted, I was probably looking on a, on a CRT or maybe one of the earlier flat screens, but oh, what is wrong with this picture though? We can't do this. We can't do this. And I think Somebody is probably already screaming at the video going, what are you doing? What are you doing? I am trying to fix it right now, trust me. Ah, there we go. Yes. Four by three. Just, ah, uh, yeah, wow. Quite amazing. I don't know what's coming on the record channel. It looks like there's some kind of audio feedback or something coming in. I think I connected the wire. Oh, the wire is touching something. Yeah, there we go. Before I started the video, I did uh, plug in some speakers and tried to figure out what was what with what charts I had. So let's just go ahead and do this. So we're going to hit on air. We're going to do manual. And this is obviously something within the schedule that we don't need. I'll have to clear the schedule out so that we can play with it more, but let's see what we got here. We got nothing on the disc other than uh, something called DoArt. Alright, so we just hit, let's see if this works. Ready? Oh, we don't hear anything. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> yeah, it would help if I turn the power on the speaker here. Four hours a day with classical music and topical analysis all night long. 
This is KNAE. Okay, audio in both channels. It's showing up on the cool little meters there, which don't look like they're overly precise, but let's go ahead and put that PSA in. It's amazing that I'm actually, it's almost like, you say riding a bike again, or learning to roller skate again, or whatever, or ski again. It's like, wow, it just, it's coming back to me so fast. And I remember some of the wonkiness, like if you hit the wrong this button. This is your NPR News and Classical Music Station, KNAU, Northern Arizona Public Radio. Are you up late reading, getting a late night snack, or at work? KNAU's Classical Overnight is here for you. KNAU broadcasts 24 hours a day with classical music through the night. This is KNAU Northern Arizona Public Radio. Thanks for joining me today on this very special occasion. I hope you hit that subscribe button. If you know anybody that likes this sort of thing or was in radio, tell them to check this video out or you got friends or whatever that are into retro tech or, or cool things. The thing with this software is it's it's running on a 386 and it's playing, it can play music, it can, it can play uh, audio effortlessly. I mean, did you ever have a 286 or 386 that just could record music and play it back like this? I mean, granted, there's a lot of hardware inside, but just an amazing thing. We'll see you next time on IJDM. Thanks for watching.